we need to think of this also as an inner product, because we are, you see if you look at it, what is the discrete time Fourier transform really? Let us, let us, let us look back at the inverse discrete time Fourier transform to fix our ideas. So, the inverse discrete time Fourier transform says that you can reconstruct x n from the, the discrete time Fourier transform in the following way. And we have already given this an interpretation. These are like the coordinates with different directions, you know different omegas are different directions, so to speak or different omegas give you different axis and, and you see these are different basis vectors. I mean they are different basis vectors for different values of omega. Now, let us get this idea clear. What we are saying is that for different values of omega over any contiguous interval of 2 pi, each omega gives you a different so called, I mean you can call it a perpendicular direction, I mean I do not know whether it is a correct thing to do, but you can call it a perpendicular direction. It is a different axis. So, you have as many like, like for example, in the time domain, every point, every value of n gives you a gives you one degree of freedom. In fact, if you look back at the way you constructed a sequence from its samples, there was the idea of a basis there. You said that x n is summation k going from minus to plus infinity x k delta n minus k and here x k were like the coordinates if you recall. And these were like the orthogonal basis vectors. Now, here of course, this is exact. Different delta n minus k's for different values of k are truly perpendicular. In fact, if you were to take a dot product of delta n minus k 1 and delta n minus k 2, I mean you, you have two sequences it would be 0 for k 1 not equal to k 2. So, if the impulses are located, if the impulse sequences have the non 0 1 located at the non 0 sample located at different points, their dot product is automatically 0. That is obvious because the sample, the non 0 samples do not overlap. So, these are all perpendicular directions so to speak. So, any sequence can be constructed from all these infinite countably infinite perpendicular directions. Now, you know if we go to finite dimensions, we can recreate this situation to some extent, but as I warned you in the previous lecture, one must not take literally the conclusions of finite dimension to infinite dimension. However, we can get a good clue about what to expect in infinite dimensions when we look at finite dimensions. So, let us look at the very simple finite dimensional case. of two dimensions. You see, let us consider this two dimensional space in which this paper lies, in which the sheet lies. I mean you can visualize the sheet extending to infinity, constituting a two dimensional space. And let us put the origin here. Let us draw two pairs of perpendicular vectors. So, one pair is like this u 1 cap and u 2 cap. I will draw another pair of perpendicular vectors u 3 cap and u 4 cap. It is very clear of course, that u 1 cap, u 2 cap has also 
u 3 cap u 4 cap form an orthonormal basis. What is an orthonormal basis? An orthonormal basis is a collection of vectors from that space, which are mutually perpendicular, take any two of them, they are perpendicular and together these vectors span that space. The word basis means they span that space. Span means you can construct any vector in that space as a linear combination of these. So, of course, it is very obvious that you can construct any vector in two dimensional space as either a linear combination of u 1 cap and u 2 cap or a linear combination of u 3 cap and u 4 cap that is very obvious. In fact, let us to emphasize that point draw a vector and illustrate what I am saying. In fact, we will not draw one, but two such vectors. So, let us redraw these. You have a u 1 cap there, you have a u 2 cap here, you have a u 3 cap here and you have a u 4 cap there and you have this vector, I will draw a long one v 1 and you have this vector v 2. And of course, it is always possible to write V 1 cap as dot product of V 1 cap with U 1 times U 1 plus dot product of V 1 cap of V 1 sorry not V 1 cap with U 2 times U 2. You see this is the beauty of an orthonormal basis. In an orthonormal basis, you can find the component of a vector along one of the orthonormal basis elements by taking the dot product of V 1 with that basis element and this can be done for each of the basis elements. So, when you have an orthonormal basis, this is the bone. The coordinates are easy to find. When the basis is not orthonormal, you know you can of course, have a basis that is not orthonormal. What I mean is, you can have a collection of vectors. For example, in this collection u 1, u 2, u 3, u 4, you can take the pair u 1, u 3. u 1, u 3 also form a basis, because you can express, you can express v 1 in terms of just u 1 and u 3 or you can express v 1 in terms of u 2 and u 4 and you can do it by using the parallelogram law. You can construct a parallelogram with sides parallel to u 1 and u 3 and they will give you a linear combination of u 1 and u 3 which gives you v 1. So, using the parallelogram law, you can always express v 1 in terms of u 1 and u 3 or u 2 and u 4. So, u 1 and u 3 together form a basis, but not an orthonormal basis. Similarly, do u 2 and u 4 together. So, the beauty of an orthonormal basis is that finding the coordinates is very easy. You see, if you take u 1 and u 3, it is an it is a basis, but not an orthonormal basis. You can of course, find the coordinates by using the parallelogram law, but finding the coordinates is not a decoupled process. That means, I cannot find the coordinates of uh, along u 1 and along u 3 independently. I need to solve two equations for two coordinates. As opposed to that, when I have an orthonormal basis, the job is very easy. I simply take the dot product of the vector along each of these orthonormal basis elements and there I am the coordinate comes. Is that clear to everybody? Any doubts on this? So, now we have done this for v 1, we of course, can do the same thing for v 1 with the basis u 3 and u 4. So, you know you can write v 1 is also dot product of v 1 with u 3 times u 3 cap plus dot product of v 1 with u 4 times u 4 cap. And of course, if you like, 
I can complete this by putting 1 comma 2 here. So, I can do this both for V 1 and V 2. Please read this as V 1. So, there I have 4, I mean coordinates for V 1, the coordinate with respect to U 1, U 2, U 3 and U 4 and similarly 4 coordinates for V 2. Now, let us write these 4 equations down. What we are saying is V 1 is of the form V 1 1 U 1 cap plus V 1 2 U 2 cap which is also V 1 3 U 3 cap plus V 1 4 U 4 cap, where the dot product of V 1 with U k is V 1 k. And similarly for V 2. So, V 2 is V 2 1 U 1 cap plus V 2 2 U 2 cap, which is also V 2 3 u 3 cap plus v 2 4 u 4 cap. Similarly, for v 2 k. Now, the dot product is very easy to calculate, because this is a perpendicular basis. So, the dot product of v 1 with v 2 in the simple two in the simple two dimensional space is v 1 1 v 2 1 plus v 1 2 v 2 2 and it is also v 1 3 v 2 3 plus v 1 4 v 2 4. So, that is what I am saying the dot product has nothing to do with which basis you use, it is independent of the basis. The dot product or the inner product is independent of basis and that is not very difficult to see. You can use, if you, if you use orthonormal basis, then calculation of the dot product is easy. You just take products of corresponding coordinates and add, but the inner product or the dot product itself does not depend on which basis you choose and that is not difficult to see at all. I mean you know if you go back to that drawing a couple of slides ago, if you were to take the dot product of V 1 and V 2 inherently it has nothing to do with what basis you have used to represent V 1 and V 2. The dot product is a property of the two vectors, not a property of its representation. However, given a representation, one can of course, calculate the dot product with convenience and ease. Now, this is exactly what that relationship is saying and now let me put it back before you with this renewed understanding. So, what we are saying in this relationship, look at this relationship once again. Look at this relationship once again. We are saying the dot product of the sequences x 1 and x 2 is independent of the representation of those vectors. You could think of the vectors represented in their natural domain or you could think of the vectors represented in the frequency domain. The dot product is unchanged and of course, in the frequency domain the dot product is defined in this way. You need to multiply corresponding points on the frequency axis and integrate over all these points instead of add, because the frequency variable is continuous. So, it is a very elegant and simple interpretation once you think about it. 